Well, welcome to the Compliance and Risk Cooler. Today, Dan and I are going to be talking about what does reopening look like? And to start it all out, we don't provide legal advice. We're not providing any not consulting here. Not even you're not <laughs> you're not even a lawyer. But we did want to start talking about some of the really interesting things that are going on and give some perspectives on what reopening looks like. So uh, I'll start out by saying, I'm Lisa Beth, and I own Lumen Worldwide Endeavors. We do compliance, ethics, and corporate governance consulting, as well as well-being coaching for the risk professional. And Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm, I'm Dan Ayala. I'm the uh, founder and uh, managing partner of Socratic. Socratic is a uh, is a security and privacy consultancy uh, with work on virtual CISO, virtual chief privacy officer, uh, and other projects for medium and uh, medium and large businesses. Great. So, should we start delving into some of the interesting things that are happening? One of the things that I've been watching closely is contact tracing. There are a myriad of privacy concerns around contract, contact tracing. And one of the big questions is whether employers can force employees to have some type of app so that they can see what's happening with them. And that's more of an employment question, but the bottom line is that there doesn't seem to be anything to prohibit that uh, yeah. if it's yeah, being in used the US, in the workplace. In the US, to my knowledge, and, right. and not legal advice, there's nothing that prohibits, uh, it can become a condition of employment, it can become a, um, it's definitely allowed. So, is that the wave of the future? And do you see that as something that companies will do their own apps or be looking for apps on the market? What are you, what are you seeing? I think there's, there's a lot of, um, the answer is it depends. It depends on your industry. It depends on your location. Depends on what your state, and again, these are US commentaries on what your state is doing. Um, you know, some states are, are opting for, to not go down the route of, broad scale uh, automated collection of, of, of contact data and rather focusing on, on um, manual contacts of confirmed cases and tracing those out because there's a, it's, it's, time, it's time spent on, on confirmed things rather than a lot of data that needs to be poured through uh, in order to find the needles in the proverbial haystack. Um, but then in other cases, you do have um, companies, uh, enterprises, or other organizations that are going to want to uh, to have steps in place for their own organization, whether it's uh, permissibility into a building, whether it's understanding who interacted with whom, whether it's understanding how saturated rooms are. Um, you know, are you meeting the new? Do you have too many people in an area uh, based on the new stand, the new occupancy standards for that, uh, based on local regulations? So the answer, as in all things in our world, is it depends. Um, but uh, everything along the range. But I de I'm definitely hearing about people doing uh, everything along the gamut. From uh, again, there's oh, there's one other thing on the other end on the on the on the the starting end, and that's just um, symptom tracking. You know, right. uh, some some regulations, some orders are requiring you to ask certain questions about you know, do you have a fever? Have you been to this place, etc., and capture those as a as a means of confirming that you have done some due diligence before letting people come into the office. Um, you know, so that's, I think at the, at the start of the range, it goes all the way up to, um, it goes all the way up to fully automated, a hundred percent collection uh, and correlation. Wow. Well, I, I know that I was watching the news this morning and, and heard something about using machine learning and um, artificial intelligence for social distancing in, both at work and in public spaces. So I, I think that there's a possibility that you could be walking through a maybe, you know, a Disney World or Disneyland or a theme park or something and have an app that tells you you're getting too close to someone else and does that start riding along the creepy line or is that something that people actually want so that they're they're you know consciously able to make decisions about where they're moving as they go through uh, a different environment 
Yeah, I think it's going to be one of those things where people are going to have to grow this. It, just like automated, uh, or sorry, um, uh, autonomous driving. From the very early days, we started talking about autonomous driving. The answer, I think the technology existed in some ways to put it in very quickly, but rather it was important to slowly maneuver people along the path of, of, of growth from nothing to, um, oh, we can sense that there's a car in front of you and slow you down from your cruise control to, oh, now we can automatically parallel park you to now we can have your car come and get you uh, from its parking spot to you know something more fully automated. And each of those takes a, a number of uh, a period of time of acceptance. I think we're in the same case in this where there's the potential to go too fast and get a backlash and people people uninstall or don't participate um, because there's still a technical factor. People aren't wired, people aren't you know um, uh, chipped <laughs> to be able to do this transaction. They're gonna need to install something on a phone. They're gonna need to carry a phone. Um, I have spoken to people who have said, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna not bring my phone with me because I don't trust what's going on with this. Well, and from a social standpoint, right, um, we're starting to see some areas that had opened up and are now seeing a pop in cases about two weeks later. Mm -hmm. um, South Korea is a really good example. And what South Korea has had a very robust mandatory contact tracing program. Mm -hmm. And while there are some significant benefits to having something that's in place and everybody has to use because then you don't have to worry about did you re reach a threshold where you've got good data right. the downside is um there there's been poor behavior in multiple venues so originally there were people who would set had had you know were confirmed covid positive who said hey if you don't give me free food from your restaurant i'm going to go visit your restaurant and then nobody will be there for i don't know how long i'm going to destroy your business which is lousy and they that. need to be prosecuted for that nice. to the other side of the coin where, right. So the current um, outbreak they are saying came from uh, some nightclubs and bars. And a lot of them were amongst the LBGTQ community. Mm -hmm. And there is some really, really negative um, biased commentary going on that um, is putting those people at risk, the people who uh, are, are affiliated with the, with the LBGTQ community. So I think there's a real risk that there will be perpetuated biases and um, opportunities for people to continue negative thought patterns about different subgroups, particularly subgroups that are not as well represented um, or have been historically, economically depressed, et cetera. So right. there, there's definitely a human factor to this whole thing that uh, makes all of these decisions very challenging. And then there's the unintended consequences of how the data could be used. So I, I listen or sometimes to, intended too, and I don't. I apologize. Intended and overly yeah. cynical, but um, there are always people thinking of uh, ways to use the data. I think there's two camps. There's the unintended consequences, the things where you put something together, and it, it really does raise something up that nobody expected. And then there are the overt nefarious desires to use, not for nefarious purposes, but for um, extended purposes beyond its original intent. Right. So from a marketing and data collection standpoint, there um, are ways that you can use this type of data to influence behaviors, particularly purchasing behaviors. Um, but there are also ways that you can use it. Um, and it's being likened to unwarranted search and seizure, right? If you, if you were in a place at a time that someone was near you, you can be shut down in your home even if your actual risk was pretty low, because at the end of the day, whether you're using the Wi-Fi technology or Bluetooth or whatever, there, there's, you know, I mean, it's, it's within a boundary of how accurate it really is. So if you were parked outside of, you know, a, a particular store and never actually went in the door, it's close enough that they may give out notices to people who were within. Oh, yeah. six to ten feet and so 
what does that do in terms of your freedom of movement? I think it's a really, real, you know, significant question. And we don't know exactly how the disease is being spread and who's more vulnerable. There's still a lot of things that are up in the air, um, but we're finding out more every day. Yeah, there's, there's also an interesting set of discussions that I've uh, been part of recently, two of them actually, one around um, why collect this anew? The, you, know, you mentioned marketing team, marketing uh, items. The marketing teams are already collecting ni- nearly all of this information when it comes to IP address, Facebook pixels, other other data that's being collected as people use systems. Again, all legally, all within theoretically within terms of service. Um, why do we need an additional collection mechanism? Uh, and then the other part is um, back to the social components that you mentioned. The um, the fact that uh, are, are we moving toward a world in which we have um, the habits and the didn't have it? And what does that do to social interaction? People who have had it, and let's let's make put some assumptions, some 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 prerequisites. One, the assumption is that having it then means that you don't get it again, right? Um, which we don't know. And you could, and we don't know how long it takes for it for you to have it, and then really not and have not, it, <laughs> right? Because we're here in like fifty days. That's a long time. But you can start to see <laughs> how um, how there could be some striations in class, in culture, in workplace dynamics, in travel dynamics, um, and you know, and just uh, and and I guess back to freedom of movement. And that's what made me think of it was you know do people that have had it then get a, a level of free movement? And people that didn't have it do not. Right. Uh, right. I mean, that's the 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 vulnerables and the already been there, done that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually uh, was reading. Apparently, Iceland uh, and Iceland Air are going to be opening up uh, to allow people to visit. But I believe one of the proposals on the table is that as soon as you get in the country, you get tested. Hmm. Which, great, that's what they're doing in Korea right now, right? You, you go and you get tested and you go to a hotel and wait for your test results to come back. And the government's putting you up in this place while you sit there and are fed because they have to feed people, right? <laughs> and you can't leave the room, right? Uh, cool, the if I can do that in Iceland. I'd rather do that in Iceland <laughs> than here. Let's go. It's all the hot water you could ever want, right? Um, <laughs> Since they've got that geothermal heat. Um, oh, right. <laughs> but, you know, what happens if you do pop positive? Or what happens... In healthcare. Right? What, what <laughs> happens... Like, uh, I, I heard recently Hong Kong had someone who came into the country on, I believe it was May 8th, and they were negative. And during their quarantine period, four days later, presumably without seeing anyone they popped positive. So were they positive when they first came in and it was a false test or what was it a false positive, you know, four days into the quarantine or, you know, what's the scoop with that? Or that it just takes that long to incubate and come up. Yeah. Right. And, and when is it transmittable? Nobody really knows. Right. So all this, and all this leads to really interesting questions around return to work too. It Um, does. Because you know, do you if you if you don't have symptoms, you walk in, you you you're it's all of the same challenges we talked about when the virus was starting to raise its when it was starting to raise its specter, um, but now doing it in a way that is you know that is much more conscious. We know about it. We know a little more about it. We're taking specific actions. The question will always be: Is it the right? Is it the right actions, or is it enough actions? Um, and I don't know that we'll know that anytime soon. Right. So things that I'm thinking about on reopen, number one, risk assessments. Understanding where you sit from a risk assessment, um, from a regulatory perspective, whether it's how close you are and how regularly you're checking your CDC and OSHA guideline compliance for what the new landscape looks like. Um, to how are you making sure that you've got your cybersecurity house in order? And is it really in order as we used bubble gum and duct tape to get everybody working from home? <laughs> um, Wait, and you're then, saying that's not enough. 
shockingly no. <laughs> and, you know, what does it look like for business travel? When is it absolutely necessary? What should you be doing for your people? And will conferences come back in 2020 or 2021? Nah, I don't you think, think so. conferences are never coming back. Not in 2020. Um, I just saw I've, in the last few days, I've seen three major organizations um, that I know of extend their travel bans indefinitely um, wow. or their travel suspension internally. So in people, there, there's two components to it. When are, when is it safe to do so? And when are people ready to do so? Um, and I Two think, very different components. Yeah. Um, and it's an opportunity. We're also in, we're also going to be in some austerity times too. You know, so beyond the health and the, and the social components of the psychological components, when are people going to be able to afford to go to have their organization send them to conferences again? Right. It's going to be a long time. Right. And I, I, one of the other things that's really on my mind is office design, open offices, hot desks. Are they gone forever? Hot desk or hot spot? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah. You know, I mean, it, how, how, how can, I've heard people trying to do like revolving or rotating schedules so that people can be in the office with, you know, one seat, you know, next off. And, and I've seen at restaurants like that too. Uh, but I think it actually is more complex than that. I think it really has to deal with other things beyond just the open space. It has to deal with airflow. Um, so any thoughts from you on that? Yeah. And I think there's, there, there's no question, um, you know, understanding both the, uh, both the legal requirements, the orders and the um, you know, local public health authorities, the state public health office, um, and then things coming from the CDC and other national organizations or, or other nations, uh, health agencies uh, are going to be really important to consider. Um, and, uh, and building that into what is it, what makes sense for people to come back to work physically. I think there's, a, there's also a really increasing discussion around, do we just not? Do we just not return people to work? Do we not make them return to work? Well, Twitter um, just announced that they're going to stay home forever. Exactly. Exactly, and then they have the option to stay home. That's the that's the important part. Is it, it, going there are forward, a lot of a lot of home. things that can't do that, right? You know, it's it's hard in manufacturing roles to um, you know really to, hard to do, to do physical therapy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yourself. Although telemedicine's coming a long way. Telemedicine um, is great, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's going to be, but, that, but this comes back to your risk assessment. Yeah, what are the roles that have to be there? What are the risks of doing so? And what are the risks of not? And, and bringing that risk mindset to managers and to parts of the organization that have been stayed against this for many, 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 many years. And who I think this is the time in which both the organization will insist on it as well as the, 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 the staff will make the play for, look, we just proved we can go, let's call it eight weeks because that's where we're at now. We can, we've gone eight weeks being able to do this remote. The world did not end. The company is still here. The organization is still operating. Let's think about this reasonably and say, okay, fine. Come in maybe one day out of every five. Come in, you know, or does your role really need to be anywhere at all? There does it need to be here physically at all. It opens up a ton of new options, especially when it comes to talent pools and in the risk and compliance and security space, the talent pools are already so narrow. Um, being able to find people out uh, wherever they are in the country or in the world uh, and bring them onto teams because there's no longer a co-location requirement um, really expands the options for people to find and retain the best talent. And more and more people want to work from home. They want to work from a remote location. Um, and I think the time we're here, it, this, is, this is a major okay. pivot. Um, also, if you look at, um, uh, there was an article in the New York Times today about, um, about some of the philosophies on real estate in Manhattan, um, and it's changing. 
yeah, yeah. They're, the expectation that these buildings are going to be fully occupied and the companies are going to buy more and more space. It's going away. Well, you know, all of these companies were working on, uh, well, not all of them, but so many have been working on how do you fit more people into, uh, you know, a smaller space. And I think, was it um, one of the big banks had just done this huge initiative to, um, put 60% more people into the same footprint, which I don't think is a great thing right now. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that kind of mindset and that button seat is going to have to change pretty dramatically. The challenge with it then becomes from a cyber perspective, right? The, the lines are overloaded. I, I, I don't know anyone that hasn't had some type of hiccup using either their phone or um, either their cell phone or their internet connection over the last eight weeks. Oh, sure. um, and right. And of course, you know, you're more techie than I am but, uh, by a no. long shot. Um, but, you, um, you look, but you look at the way these things were architected. Every system is architected for a set of use cases. None of the infrastructure use case, none of the infrastructures that we work on, we're built around this use case in which nobody travels, nobody goes, nobody, everybody's using what has been previously termed home internet with very low, with very low usage. Home, home which is now school. Well, exactly. <laughs> I, you know, between, yeah, between, um, between streaming school, streaming work meetings, um, YouTube, because that's inevitably there <laughs> um, in large volumes, and uh, you know, and just general browsing, you now have home internet profiles that are are just are, are huge comparatively. Now, I, thanks to the um, you know, thanks to uh, the internet providers for removing things like data caps. By the way, I really hope this means we'll never see data caps again, um, because I think they are they they I don't think that they help or do what they're supposed to do, what they were intended or thought to do. Um, we want people to use internet. We want people to use access, to access this stuff. Um, but we're going to have to change some of the architectures to allow for it, to allow for this new Absolutely. use model. Well, and what I had heard for years and years and years, and this probably isn't true, was that all of these high speed fiber optics were being put in to make everything lightning fast. It doesn't, it's not feeling lightning fast right now. I mean, it's better than it was when I grew up. Or, well, it depends on where you are, right? too. If you're if you are in a multi-tenant uh, multi-tenant dwelling in a in a major city, you've got gigabit access. You've got amazingly blazingly fast access to get an apartment. Um, but you have to be <laughs> in the right locations because fiber is very expensive. Um, yep. Even in the major, even in places where I mean, AT and T had a product called um, a project called Lightspeed many, 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 probably 25 years ago now, in which they were going to do this fiber project. They ended up not running it all the way to the house, to the premise, to the house. They ended up writing, running it to boxes in the area. It's what's become Uverse now, but it's not fiber between that box in my house. It's still copper because infrastructure in the U.S., there's so much existing infrastructure and the cost to replace it is immense. These are some of the things we're going to deal with as we make, as if we make these pivots, is some people have their entire internet coming over the same copper that was put in their house in 1960 when it was built, or in the 1960s when it was wired by Ma Bell originally. Um, right. And that doesn't facilitate very fast internet, and it's expensive to replace. Right. All of these things to think about. So um, beyond that, what are you seeing from a fraud perspective? Because I'll tell you on the compliance, risk, ethics side of the house, I'm seeing fraud and loads of it. But what's going on from the information security cyber side of the house? Yeah, it's been um, it's been really interesting. We've seen you know, increased increased attempts, a lot more, a lot more phishing, a lot more things. You know, phishing is one of those topics, or, or attempted use of technology to get uh, to do phishing or to do uh, you know, more targeted items to get either information or get people to provide credentials. Um, it's really opportunistic, and this is a you know, these are the times in which people are. Um, they're displaced. People aren't in their normal working place. They're not running their normal daily, um, you know, their normal daily operations. They're scared. Um, people around them may be having, um, 
you know, maybe having symptoms, maybe having, you know, having gotten infected. Um, and as we start to talk about contact tracing, uh, that they, they're worried about that alert that comes in that says you've been in contact with somebody. Well, all these are avenues to get people to want to get more information. We just saw, I just saw something today uh, in which there's a huge increase in, um, it's not actually, it wasn't in the US, but it's an opportunity in, um, for, for attackers to uh, send you a text message with a link to get more information saying that you've been in contact with somebody who is, who has, um, who has tested positive and uh, you need to go here to register yourself and get this information. So it's preying on this. And people don't necessarily think before they click. They go there, okay, enter some information about myself. Um, and phishing, 20 years later, finally is starting to look good. Yeah, in the past, oh, it, it looks was relatively great. easy to, um, to pick out, you know, either through typos or, or misalignments or other things. But now it's exact duplicates. Um, so people have to be really, really, really conscious. So awareness is really important. Situational uh, awareness from an education perspective, but also situational awareness. Uh, everything you look at, look at it with some scrutiny. Uh, and I'm trying to create cynics, but we're trying to keep people from, um, you know, from playing into the hands of those who are using psychology to try and get the best of them. Absolutely. And so what about know, on the what about on the on the uh, on the compliance side? On the compliance. <laughs> Well, it's through the roof. Uh, <laughs> everything from people stealing PPE from work and selling it on a black market or using it uh, inappropriately outside of work to, you know, stolen credentials. There's actually, um, did you hear about the fellow who flew over to Germany and decided because he was apparently lovesick? And he put on a high visibility outfit that was um, very similar to what some of the maintenance people would wear at the Frankfurt airport yeah, and tried to get through using falsified credentials. <laughs> yeah. He, he and got not caught Ill, and was Ill, sent back. Love <laughs> that was, that was lovesick. Yes. It was not, not like, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's like, people are doing things to try to, you know, get around the, the, the regulations that are in place. Um, and you'll always have that. It's just that now, there are so many other barriers um, between stay in place and um, uh, and other things that people are getting more and more creative. Even me personally, I've had two situations. One, I ordered something, it still hasn't arrived two months later, and I'm starting to wonder, uh, was this really legit or not? But there's not a good way to get in contact because frankly, Everything's so overwhelmed. Even my bank is automating responses to inquiries because they're so overwhelmed trying to deal with SBA loans and everything like that. So you can't talk to somebody and try to get this resolved. The fraud departments are completely overloaded at the credit cards and everything like that. Um, so on top of the fact that they've had to move, displace people to work from home and work, at, you know, they're making those changes correct. at the same time. Correct. So it's a little bit, um, it's challenging. And this is where fraudsters love to play. Mm -hmm. They love to play. And Irregular operations. Right. It's irregular operations. And they're good at it. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. So I think we should probably wind up for today. If people have more questions, they can reach out to us at info at mentorcore dot biz. We'll be coming back again with another compliance and risk cooler in the future. If you'd like to participate in that, we really love it if people want to join us um, and have an interactive dialogue. But that's about it for me. Anything else, Dan? No, I'm good. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us and um, have a great uh, rest of the day. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation on uh, on MentorCore. We've got the we've got some interactive forums. We've got some forums that are active, uh, topics around compliance, around mentoring, around leadership, around security and privacy, um, asking questions, getting answers from across the community. Uh, it's a great time to come and take a look at that again at MentorCore.biz. Great. Good. Have a good well, thanks, day. Lisa Beth. Great chat, and uh, thanks everybody who joined us. And we'll uh, talk to you again soon.